I'm Stephen Worles. I teach in the political science department. I'm also the associate director of the project for the study of liberal democracy. I want to thank the many sponsors of this event with a special appreciation for the generosity of the Institute for Humane Studies and the Jack Miller Center, both of which organizations have done great good work in educating students and faculty and citizens generally about the Constitution. And it is Constitution Day, which recognizes the anniversary of the signing of the Constitutional Plan in Philadelphia. It still needed to be ratified, which it was. The topic for today is the freedom of speech, which was made part, uh, was made a civil right by the First Amendment to that Constitution. And it is a cornerstone of a um, healthy and vigorous politics in a liberal democracy. It has a distinctly, in the First Amendment, political character. The more specific topic is the freedom of speech on college campuses. And the question is whether and how that freedom of speech is a cornerstone of a healthy academic life. The rationale for freedom of speech, such as on campus, is not po political. It's different and not political, but it has been become entangled in politics, which is why we are here today. We have a panel of speakers, and there are, there are a good number of them, so I will be unjustly brief in my introduction of them. Jonathan Marks. Uh, is professor of politics at Ursinus College, uh, and his, uh, he's working on a book called, very appropriately, Becoming Reasonable People, a conservative case for liberal education. Laura Beth Nielsen, eh? professor of sociology at Northwestern, with particular interests in law and equality, race and gender. She also, she has a, finished a book called Race on Trial. And Alison Stanger is a political scientist at Middlebury College. Uh, she's written on a range of things, uh, but her latest book is Life, Liberty and Leaks. That's L-E-A-K-S, not, L, not the, the vegetable or whatever it is. Our moderators, Dan Cullen, teaches in the political science and is the director of the uh, project for the study of liberal democracy. We will take questions after, and if you want to just be bold and raise your hand, we'll take that question. If you would rather write it down, write it down, but please print clearly, because I will be reading them. Thank you. Good. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. And let me uh, just add, if you think you've got a particularly good question, write it on the back of a $10 bill and pass it to the, to the side. So we've, we've heard from John Rauch about the free speech problem, threats to free speech. In, in society, we tried to s stay away as much as we, as we could from the question of free speech on, on campus, but that's one of our, our areas of, of focus. And I'd just like to invite each of you in, in turn to say, how do you understand our situation? Are we in a crisis? Do we have a problem? If so, what? If, if not, why not? How do you, how do you see it, Laura Beth? Um, well, I want to just say thank you for having me on your beautiful campus first. It's quite lovely. Um, I can't think of a better topic for Constitution Day at a university um, than the debated crisis facing free speech on college campuses. Um, my own position is that we're not in a any kind of new crisis, um, but there are important new things to consider. As long as we continue to approach these conflicts and incidents around free speech with our responsibility and our eye on being educators um, and furthering the academic mission of the university, I think that um, we're well equipped to handle them. 
but we need to be considering and innovating about how best to help our students be exposed to new ideas, to engage with them, and to learn from us and from each other. So to do that, um, we need to do the hardest thing that free speech requires, which is to listen. And we approach this discussion on the heels of an election that's revived, our, um, revived or at least rendered visible the fact that dehumanization, racism, sexual assault, and mockery of people with disabilities still serves as a rallying cry enough to elect a um, United States president. Hate crimes are on the rise, overt white supremacy has been rebranded alt-right, and we're embroiled in debates about things like biological racial inferiority that uh, we thought we finished half a century ago. Now my approach to thinking about these things is um, I'm a sociologist and I'm a legal scholar. My, free speech, my views on free speech combine jurisprudential, social theoretic, and empirical perspectives, the liberal science model that we have been, we're talking about in the last um, session. All of these kinds of analysis are required to really understand controversial speech, but our tendency is to isolate these speech debates and from their social context and hide patterns that serve to create situations where we're talking past each other on college campuses and beyond. Um, first, some legal context. We all know and take for granted that local, state, and federal laws limit all kinds of speech with a blessing or a blind eye from the judiciary. We regulate commercial speech, obscene speech, slander, libel, panhandling, and inciting lawless action, just to name a few. We do it by balancing benefits and harms. Now, when the harm of hateful speech is constructed as one person or even a hundred persons hurt feelings or oversensitivity, of course the idea that we should limit a core constitutional value like speech seems ridiculous. But I wanna broaden our focus, provide some empirical data, and put microaggressions, racist hate speech, and sexual speech just this side of threat in a broader social context so that we can conduct the kind of constitutional balancing that's required. Um, when something as important as free speech is in the balance. Because equality is also a constitutional value, and we have inequality in the, First in the First Amendment jurisprudence that we have to think about. Legally, right now, as was made clear in the last session, we tell members of traditionally disadvantaged groups like racial minorities that the regulation of hate speech is unconstitutional, except under very limited circumstances, and this goes to the definition question, which the Supreme Court has talked about, and we can talk about it. Facebook has a very clear definition, which I've talked to their lawyers about. Um, there, are some, there are some definitions, um, but college women at orientation events are told that crowds of fraternity boys chanting no means yes and yes means anal is something they have to tolerate in the name of free speech, even if they feel like they're no longer members equal members of the campus community, or even if it's chanted under their bedroom window. At the same time, we see a powerful regime of free speech that protects popular ideas. In judicial circuits where panhandling regulation is allowed and has been for years, part of the justification is that the targets of the speech, commuters in the New York subway in one iconic case, have a legitimate purpose for being in public. They're trying to get to work. Chambers of Commerce pass anti-panhandling laws for customers to have tidy shopping areas. Um, so we have laws banning begging, even if the beggar is saying, homeless veteran, please help, which if you don't think that's a political message, I don't know, it is a political message. So workers, tourists, and consumers are protected from requests for money when we decide that this space is more functional or certain people in it are more important. Consider also the Westboro Baptists. Yes, the Supreme Court upheld the right of the Westboro Baptists to spew their hate speech. Um, but after the Snyder case, little known fact, it inspired congressional override, which is the term that's used when Congress overrides a Supreme Court decision, um, in the form of the Honoring Americans Veterans Act, which prohibits protests 300 to 500 feet around veterans' funerals two hours before, during, and after their funerals. So mourners of veterans protected. There's not a word in it about the, um, the anti-LGBTQ funeral attendees, the LGBTQ um, soldiers, and so on. So soldiers and workers are protected from troubling speech, but white women and people of color just walking down public 
streets, living in their dorm room on a college campus, are not protected from some speech. And we do allow in our jurisprudential analysis of First Amendment cases, we do think about targets, as I've just um, demonstrated. Um, I argue, and I think I have some data to back it up, but we can certainly argue about it. Um, the policy driver here is the conception of harm. Viewed in isolation as one particular event, it's hard to see the social origins of these kinds of hate speech. Um, I argue that continually harassing members of disadvantaged groups is not just speech, it is doing something. It is resulting in a harm. The harm of subordination, the harm of perpetuating inequality, the harm of creating inequality. Just like we understand that possibility in the workplace in a way that we didn't in 1950, we now understand that continued sexual harassment of women in the workplace demeans their authority and reduces their opportunities for economic equality. So I just have two teeny quick examples to make it concrete. Um, the campus sexual assault debates um, about Title IX, should universities be in the business of adjudicating sexual assault? What, what does that mean? There are two kinds of problems here. There's the massive underreporting of sexual assault that the peer-reviewed empirical research consistently demonstrates, but there's also this problem of due process that the Harvard law professors and some journalists are really um, interested in. Whichever side of that debate you come down on, there are, um, there's work to be done. We need to be making progress on reducing the number of sexual assaults. I hope we all agree on that. Why? One in four women and one in nine men report rape, being raped or sexually assaulted in college. Sexual assault and the university trouble dealing with it may be responsible for as much as 10% of the dropout rate, resulting in further gendered economic inequality. One in 13 rape survivors attempt suicide in their life. So certainly a deprivation of um, life means uh, deprivation of um, a fundamental right. So in this social context, a young woman's reaction to a chant no means yes takes on a different meaning. It's not merely hurtful. It's exclusionary from the educational and um, economic opportunities. I could go on about gender hierarchy, but let's talk about racial microaggressions. These are the brief and commonplace daily verbal behaviors, environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, another little post-it note, intentionality is something we might talk about, or negative racial slights and insults to persons. And these are all, all accomplished through mere speech, some of them. Discussions of microaggression on campus is interesting because of the circularity. When students of color, African American primarily, indicate a desire for faculty to be um, educated about microaggressions and the way that that creates exclusionary educational opportunities, um, Professors are often told their free speech is being viol um, violated, calling them snowflakes or wanting to be coddled. I would argue the opposite. This is a, a new generation of students bravely demanding to be heard what it's like to be a member of a subordinated group on a college campus, which is an extension of what it's like to be as a member of a subordinated group in, um, as a citizen of this country. Um, African American men make 70 cents for every dollar as their similarly situated white male counterparts. A country where African Americans have a 30% greater chance of being stopped by the police. They're five times more likely to have a felony conviction than their white counterparts. And they are far more likely to receive a longer sentence for the same crime. State violence in the form of police killing and capital punishment are disproportionately enacted of men of color. The discussion of microaggressions is an extension of these debates um, in broader society. Um, moreover, the, there's a lot of quite good research about the physical and psychological effects of being the target of microaggressions. I'll just run through them fast. Negative mental health outcomes, including depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, alcohol and drug use, and high blood pressure. Um, oh, sorry, sound gurus. Um, but unfortunately, our capacity to understand those not like ourselves is severely limited. I can talk about the research on that. Um, but this debate over who's silencing whom has us skipping right over understanding what the lived experience of our fellow classmates are. 
And so what I'm hoping to bring to the debate is the idea that discussions of speech should acknowledge the fact that America has failed to live up to its promise to white women and people of color, people of um, minority sexual orientations, minority religions, and um, there is new evidence about the harms of hate speech that have to be part of the debate. Thanks for that, Laura Beth. I did it. Jonathan Marks. I, oh, <laughs> did in 11 minutes, sorry. Um, thanks to uh, Professor Worles for his surprisingly stingy introduction. <laughs> uh, Professor Cullen and everyone who is involved in putting this together, it's an honor to be the designated Jonathan for this panel. We're playing by American League rules, so there has to be a designated Jonathan on every panel during this conference. That's right. I'm going to start like an academic and qualify absolutely everything I'm about to say. Um, I'm with Larry Summers, a former president of Harvard, um, who said when he was asked what was going on campus nowadays, and he's a critic of campus life in many ways, he said, well, the main thing that's happening is what's always been happening. Professors teach courses, students take courses, they make friends, they have formative experiences, they're educated. So I'm going to be talking about a couple of incidents in one corner of one neighborhood of our vast higher education landscape. And I wouldn't even claim that what I'm going to about to talk about is fully representative of the school at which it takes place, much less the whole of higher education. So I'm not going to be arguing that there's a free speech crisis on campus, even though I think these incidents have some wider resonance. There are some publications that specialize in finding some undergraduate somewhere who said something silly about something at some time and lamenting the fate of higher education on that basis, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not with them. So I'm gonna take you to Poughkeepsie, New York. That's, that's my treat, but first, let me set the stage for this. In 2005, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement was launched. BDS, its friends and its uh, enemies call it that, um, has a pretty simple argument that Israel is an apartheid state comparable to or worse than apartheid-era South Africa and therefore deserves to be ostracized. So BDS supporters call for, among other things, a comprehensive academic and cultural boycott of Israel. All right, now we're going to Poughkeepsie. Spring 2014. Jill Schneiderman, a professor of geology, found herself on the wrong side of BDS supporters at Vassar College because she took a class to Israel and the West Bank to study the politics of water. Now, Schneiderman's on the left, and she considers herself a supporter of Palestinian rights, but she was working with organizations that bring together Palestinians and Israelis to tackle environmental issues. From the standpoint of many in BDS, this kind of cooperative arrangement isn't kosher because it distracts from Israel's crimes. Students picketed the course, so they stood outside um, of the door and tried to persuade enrollees that continuing in it was tantamount to supporting apartheid. There was an on-campus component of the course. It was possible to picket it. So tensions rose, naturally, and Vassar's Committee on Inclusion and Excellence held a forum, which is what you do in these situations, and the co-chair opened things up by urging attendees to forget cardboard notions of civility, civility being the tool of the oppressor. The forum, in other words, proceeded on the assumption that the disruptive protesters were on the side of the angels, and Schneiderman, who had had some complaints about the way the protest had gone down, was on the other side. And so the forum unfolded, as you might expect. Here's how one witness described it. It was truly unsettling. Torrents of anger ripped through the gathering. The spirit of that young progressive space was that Israel was a blot on civilization. If a student had gotten up and said, I love Israel, he or she would have been mocked and scorned into silence. Now, that unsettled observer was not some kind of pro-Israel conservative. It was actually Philip Weiss, who believes that the Jewish National Project is at bottom selfish and racist. If Weiss, who sides with the protesters, saw it the way he did, that lends credibility to some of Schneiderman's colleagues. 
who though they sat on their hands during the forum, after the forum told Schneiderman, you know, thanks a lot, we thought it was a show trial, right? Weiss lends credibility also to Schneiderman's assessment that the forum, presided over by faculty, made a mockery of Fasser's mission statement, which calls for respectful debate. Now, before I flash forward, let me comment on this incident. And this goes to the question Professor Cullen asked. Free speech really wasn't the issue here at all. Pro-BDS students and faculty exercised their freedom of speech. Jill Schneiderman exercised her freedom of speech. The issue was, who was minding Vassar's mission? Who was minding Vassar's mission? You can ask about any campus, what is it that faculty, administrators, and students are ashamed of? Are they ashamed that they're going to be thought to be on the side of the oppressor if they get on the wrong side of certain individuals or groups? Or are they ashamed of the possibility that their campus, whose mission ties it to analytical, informed, and independent thinking and sound judgment, that's Vassar's mission or part of it, is transformed into a vehicle for a movement that it's heresy to question? If they're more ashamed of the first than the second, that's a sign of ill health no matter how robust the free speech protections on campus are. Now we're going to flash forward. January 2016. Jasbir Poir came to Vassar College to lecture on inhumanist biopolitics. Eight academic programs and departments sponsored her talk. Poir announced that she was engaged in a solidarity project that seeks to invite new participants into the quest for Palestinian liberation. What people were tentatively calling the third or knife intifada was then underway in Israel and the West Bank, and Poir, as she has every right to do, spoke up for armed resistance. Now, Poir was already reasonably well known for making incendiary claims about Israel, of which those who invited her were certainly aware. Not content, like other activists, to accuse Israel of genocide, she argues in published work that Israel forgoes genocide. They forgo genocide because it's more diabolical to keep the Palestinians alive. The Palestinians, she says, are not human enough, even human enough for death. But Poor concedes in all fairness that Israel has motives other than cruelty for not committing genocide. First, Israelis are greedy. Maimed people beat dead people any day when it comes to profit-making and capital circulation. Second, they're Holocaust hogs. The Jewish-Israeli population, she says, can't afford to hand over genocide and thereby their victimhood bonanza to some other population. Third, Israelis are curious, and living Palestinians are a useful supply of body parts for research and experimentation. She reported, and I'm just saying kind of way the rumor, that Israel delayed returning Palestinian bodies in order to mine their organs for scientific research. As she had every right to say. Still, it's troubling that so many academic departments sponsored, that is, put their imprimatur on a speaker who could be expected to make these, at best, borderline anti-Semitic claims. What happened next was also troubling, and maybe more troubling. According to the transcript, Poir was not asked even one question about the claims I've just described. In fact, Poir wasn't challenged at all, unless you count the person who worried that she'd neglected Israel's crimes against the environment and focused too much on human beings. But the lecture became public, and a couple of weeks later, Mark Udoff and Ken Walzer, both distinguished professors who now lead the anti-BDS Academic Engagement Network, wrote in the Wall Street Journal, as they had every right to do, that Poir's speech was anti-Semitic. And they called on Professor Hill, President Hill, I should say, and faculty to confront anti-Semitism with the primary tools at their disposal, free speech and rigorous academic inquiry. And this op-ed did inspire faculty to speak out against Walzer and Yudov. A letter signed by hundreds of educators implicated the pair, neither one of them right-wing, neither of whom had called for censorship, in a right-wing censorship plot. The signers assert that the claims we just heard, that Israel keeps Palestinians alive out of cruelty, greed, and the desire to keep genocide for themselves, they don't refer to them specifically, but they refer to the whole of Poir's work and talk, are grounded in serious scholarship and thorough research. 
I asked one signer about this, who it turned out hadn't looked into the matter in detail and didn't know what Poir had specifically claimed, but had liked Poir's prior work. No doubt more than one of the signers stepped forward in their capacity as scholars to judge a serious matter that they had not investigated. Vassar's leaders also weren't happy about the Wall Street Journal op-ed. In a webinar for 930 or so alums and parents, the chairman of Vassar's board said that poor shouldn't be censored, which again, Rudolf and Walter had never suggested. The chair had hard words only for certain Mendelssohn alums who had made this whole incident public. He was not happy with them. Now, as in the 2014 case, free speech is not the issue here, right? Poir was free to speak. Walter and Udoff were free to respond. Faculty were free to criticize Walter and Udoff. Board chairs are always free to be evasive. As in the 2014 case, the issue is who minds the mission of promoting analytical, informed, and independent thinking? Probably not the departments who put their imprimatur on Poirot's work knowing roughly what she was going to say. Certainly not the Vassar faculty who were present for this talk and had no questions. Definitely not the faculty outside of Vassar who lazily assumed or deliberately pretended that poor, their kind of people, was the victim of a right-wing smear campaign. They slapped their credentials. They slapped their credentials on the table to defend her claims without, in the case of the scholar I questioned, knowing what those claims were. Not Vassar's leadership either, who for the most part anyway, directed their attention to external censors and Mendelssohn alums without asking whether Jill Schneiderman's experience or the Poir affair indicated that more needed to be done to shield the college's mission from uncritical and intemperate partisanship. I lift that last phrase from the 1915 Declaration of Principles on Academic Freedom and Academic Tenure, which calls on academic professionals to hold each other accountable for departures from the requirements of the scientific spirit and method. That formulation may be too narrow, but I find it a useful indication of how the way of life that academic freedom and freedom of speech on campus are meant to protect can erode even when those protections are not directly challenged. Thank you, John. Well, happy Constitution Day, everybody. Can you hear me? My scarf seems to be falling over, so raise your hand if you know I fade out uh, as we go forward. It's, it's wonderful to be here, and it's particularly great to see so many students in the audience. I am going to be telegraphic in the interest of hearing what you're thinking about, because that's, that's what I'd like to know especially interested in your question. So I'll just make a few points on what's already been said and perhaps throw a few new things into the mix for you to think about. For those of you who don't know, I'm the, that Middlebury professor. That might not even mean anything because, you know, happened over a year and a half ago. So just briefly, uh, I was injured after an event with Charles Murray was shut down. We did manage to do a webcast, which was interrupted with fire alarms, had a dramatic escape with... Um, students climbing on cars and all kinds of other huge drama, things I never would have expected would ever, ever happen to me. And I wound up with whiplash and a concussion. So why did that happen? Well, just very briefly, I think it was a perfect storm because in a sense, Vermont is a bubble within a bubble. Republicans don't even come the state of Vermont because they know there's no hope whatsoever of them ever you know, winning an electoral plurality. Um, and it's Bernie Sanders land. But apart from that, it was also very much a product of the particular moment in time, which is right after the election of Donald Trump. And I think students were responding quite legitimately, not in the forms of protests they took, but in the general sense of frustration with a series of undelivered promises, especially to black Americans in this country, and I don't have to rehearse what those are. Uh, a, a frustration point had been reached and it just bubbled over in unfortunate ways, I think, because in many ways the pro student protesters brought about the very opposite of what they wanted to see, and we can talk about different strategies of resistance, but I think the consequences piece is very important. I would just say that uh, emotion carried the day at Middlebury in a series of ways and 
Emotion is important because we would be robots, not humans if there weren't emotion. Uh, so emotions need to be validated and listened to and heard. But when it comes down to strategizing about bringing about change you want to see, there's no substitute for reason. And I can say more about that if, if you're interested. I think this whole question of hate speech is a very interesting one. And Laura Beth has already spoken quite eloquently about it. I would just add this to the, the mix, that when we're talking about hate speech, we get into a defin definitional problem. But what we also have is, 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 is a distinction between what's going on in the classroom, potentially, and what's going on in the dorms or, or the, the extracurricular life of, of a college. Because for me, when I think about hate speech, hate speech is something that offends, it wounds um, in a devastating way. And if I think about the appropriate classroom environment I want to generate, hate speech, speech would never be permitted. Because that is not a learning environment in which everybody has an equal place at the table. So in my, um, in my classroom, there's, there are really no need for speech codes if I lay out the groundwork for what I want to see. And I will start out and say to my students, look, you know, we are going to have to learn to engage civilly with one another, even if we passionately disagree. And this is going to be a difficult thing for you in some ways because that behavior is not modeled for you anywhere. You don't see it on television. You don't see it in the larger culture. It's something we're going to learn together. And to do that, we just have to be open and empathetic listeners. And we have to acknowledge that we're coming from all different backgrounds, walks of life. I'm sure Rhodes is a diverse, has a diverse student body with socioeconomic diversity, perhaps some ethnic diversity. Middlebury, Middlebury is the same. And if you've got a bunch of people coming from very different perspectives, they're going to say stupid things that wind up offending someone. And we've just got to be prepared to apologize when that happens. If we don't understand why it was offensive, that's a learning moment where you can learn something. And I have just found that if I lay the ground rules in my classroom for what I want to see, which is basically, <laughs> I want arguments, not ad hominem attacks. You, you all know the difference between an ad hominem attack on the person's intention, who they are, versus the arguments they're using. Ad hominem attacks have no place in my classroom, and I'll shut them down if I hear them happening, or not in a mean way. I just want to make people aware that that's what they're doing. And we generally have a good um, learning environment. So hate speech has no place uh, on, on a college campus. I don't think you need codes to address that. I think you just have to emphasize the importance of a learning environment that's open and inviting for all participants. And you know, to do unto others as we would like to have done unto us. That might seem sort of simple, but in some ways these things are more simple than people make them out to be. Second, the issue of microaggressions. Um, I, think, I think, again, you can combat those as well if we just all embrace empathetic listening. That is, if we all try to understand those who are different from us, and be prepared to make mistakes and be human and apologize if we said something that's offensive and move on. That's a great learning environment, but it also makes life more fun to get to know people that are different. You learn stuff about yourself through interacting with someone who's different from you. And that's valuable for both, for both parties. So if I were to say, think of the biggest thing I've learned from the experience that happened to me, which in some sense is going to sound weird to you, to me it's something of a gift because I think it taught me to be more empathetic in all sorts of ways. I see things I didn't see before. You know, that's what education is like. You can have that here at Rhodes College without getting a concussion if you just adopt a more um, open-minded stance. The biggest thing I've learned, I think, is that bell curves don't matter. Individuals do. And if we adopt the maxim of speaking freely, in other words, not self-censoring and allowing others to do the same, and realizing that we're human and are going to make mistakes, we can push this forward in all kinds of productive ways. We're not going to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. In some sense, to me, when I see this quest for the perfect language, 
I think that's all well and good. I'd love to be perfect too, but good luck with that. We're human and we're not gonna be perfect, so let's settle for the best we, we can do. Admit our mistakes when we make them and allow others to do the same. Finally, we need to all open our minds and our hearts if we're going to learn all we can and get the most out of our educational experience and out of life itself. If we adopt this as a maxim and allow others to do the same, I think you'll have a great education and a great life. In short, the bottom line, I think, is that both racism and some extreme forms of anti-racism can operate as ideologies uh, and do great harm and also impede learning. So I guess this is really just a call for each and every one of us modeling the behavior we want to see. And if we all make more of an effort to do that, I think we're going to have not tranquil campus communities, but productive discussions and a better learning environment than what the current situation might be. I don't know what's going on at Rhodes, but I can tell you right now that when people are self-censoring for whatever reason, it's the death of liberal education. You can't have liberal education with self-censorship, so we've got to find a way to transcend that. Final point. Um, I think we don't have a freedom of speech problem on our campus today. We have a free inquiry problem in the sense that we are really having a debate about the mission of the university, but nobody's talking about it, that being the debate we're having. I think it would be much more productive if we could somehow focus on the debate that's actually taking place rather than getting distracted by what I see, see as secondary issues. And we can, you might have your own ideas about what the mission, mission of the university should be. I'm convinced that universities exist for truth seeking and individuals seek truth and it's the job of administrators to provide an environment in which everybody has an equal opportunity to do that. And that's what we're working, out, working on. So I'll close with that. I'm really hoping we can hear from the students and see what they're thinking because I'm looking at you and you, you know, it's quite an interesting bunch. Maybe I should close by saying, how many people who use the she pronoun in this room think the air conditioning is up too high? <laughs> and I, I mean, I this might be Rhodes' first bias incident report. <laughs> I'll close with that. Right. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> the correct answer is Memphis is unbearable this time of year. We need the temperature this low. It's um, people from Canada can't can't work in. What in pronoun those do you use? Uncomfortable. <laughs> he, it was assigned to him. It was assigned to him. Yeah. Uh, like the age of 50, when happiness begins, November is coming, and bearability yeah. begins in, in Memphis. Well, look, uh, those, those are, are all uh, Im important points, and there's, I, can, I can tell there's a lot of agreement on, on the panel, but I, I want to try to do the devil's work and solicit a little bit of, of disagreement first. And by the way, uh, students especially do be thinking about hardball questions and write them on those $20 bills uh, <laughs> and pass them along at, when, you're, when you're ready. Laura Beth, I, I think one of your most em emphatic points was uh, contra Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff that students aren't, student protesters aren't seeking safety they're seeking justice, and uh, there's been a fundamental mischaracterization of what's, what's going on. And there's, there's not only a political reality that stands behind that, Allison alluded to that, but there's a theory, sometimes called intersectionality. You've written about this a bit in your, your book. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Jonathan Marks, do you, do you think that Laura Beth is, is 
correct in that, that the, the emphasis on safetyism, as Haidt and Lukianov put it, is, is really misplaced, that this is about, this is, this is really about a, a political question and even a theoretical question. Okay, um, a, a couple of things about that. The first is, I'm, I'm not sure it's that easy to disentangle an interest in safety from an interest in justice. I think at least they're sometimes related. There are many different kinds of requests for safe spaces. Um, sometimes you want something called a safe space because um, you want to recharge. You don't want to be going at each other hammer and tongs all the time. You just want to hang out. Sometimes you want a safe space to talk with somebody to whom you don't have to explain all your operating assumptions, right? Maybe you want to go to the Young Republican Club and talk to somebody to whom you don't have to explain everything and see how much further you can go with those operating assumptions. These are two varieties um, of safe space. Um, but there's a variety of the safe space argument that says the reason that we require safety is because society is so unjust. And I, I agree, it's not a snowflake kind of argument, um, but at its most radical, it makes a claim not only about society outside the walls of the university, but also society within the walls of, uni of the university. Um, why might African Americans feel unsafe? Um, because the university, as well as the wider society, though posing as something called liberal democracy, is in fact the arm of a white supremacist regime, right? Um, why is it that women need a safe space? Um, for analogous reasons sometimes, right? Um, that the university setting as well as outside society is, is a rape culture, right? We, we need it to be warm too. As well, yeah. yes. Um, so those things are, are both very important and, and, and they need to be discussed, right? But um, the university makes certain claims for itself, right? One of the claims it makes for itself is the... Um, claim that Allison was, was talking about. It's a claim about a mission, that we're out to pursue the truth and follow the arguments wherever they lead. Now, you might make the argument that, that that's a sham, right? We need a safe space from that because the people who say that are, are in effect lying either to others or to themselves and merely want to maintain the horrifying status quo. That's an argument that has to be entertained, but it's not a way the university can live, right? Because if that assumption is true, there is no university. And you may as well pack your bags and go home. Yeah. Thanks for that. Let me, uh, Laura Beth, quote something from, from Jonathan, Jonathan Rauch and ask you to comment, because I think it bears on, on what you said in your opening remarks. Jonathan wrote, quote, the answer to bias and prejudice is pluralism, not purism. The answer is not to try to legislate bias and prejudice out of existence or drive them underground, but to pit biases and prejudices against each other and make them fight it out in the open. That's, that's a more aggressive model than you had, had proposed a, a moment ago, Allison, and I wanna hear your thoughts about that too. But Laura Beth, do you, do you, th I'll just ask you to, to respond, given what you said about what happens in, uh, what happens on campus with what's said and how it affects people, what would you, what would you want to add or subtract to that? Well, I, I, I think um, one useful thing is to talk about the different aspects of a campus community. There is the classroom in which you don't, it's, never gonna be a completely safe space. We are going to challenge each other and we can try to have ground rules of respect and we can police them in the ways that we do and that's our academic freedom as professors to run those classes, how we think people learn best. Um, and the overwhelming research shows that um, a, a person feeling threatened is not learning, right? So one thing we need to do is 
think about what's different in a classroom versus bringing an outside speaker to a campus. You know, what about when eight people want to bring someone to UC Berkeley and the, Berkeley spends a million dollars on security? That affects everybody else's education. There's an equity issue there. And then we need to think about the university as a living space as well. And so these issues kind of get blurred together. But to the question, I absolutely believe that these, the ideas have to be argued about vigorous and discussed vigorously. I'm not saying we shouldn't have those conversations. I'm saying we need to have them in particular ways. And we need to use the empirical evidence that social psychology is giving us that some people are, for example, my department, Legal Studies at Northwestern, we have a class about um, police killing, police brutality. For the last couple of years, it was taught, and so we, we, the professor used videos, the body cam videos, and then we interrogated the cases and what the empirical data shows about how much faster police, black and white, are likely to shoot a black suspect holding a phone. You know, you go through all of those data, and we had been showing the, the body cam footage. There's now a body of research in psychology that shows that that is um, trauma-inducing for black students. It is not as trauma-inducing for white students. We need to incorporate that new information, which we have done. The videos will not be shown in class. They will be optional if students want to watch them. There's the link on the syllabus. Um, but what I, so I guess we do need to have these ideas vigorously debated, but we need to be bringing in the evidence. One in 13 rape survivors attempt suicide in their lifetime. When we're talking about what the campus sexual assault policy is, you're talking to people who um, have experienced that trauma. Um, and police violence too. So, I, so I, I feel like I don't disagree. I'm just saying, how about all this empirical evidence about how to do it best? Let's, let's let liberal science do its thing in, in the right way. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Marks, you, you told this um, compelling, <laughs> startling story about what happened at, at Vassar in the second incident, which was the complete failure of the model of liberal science, right? No, no vetting. Um, not only that, the positive endorsement by, by academics and departments who who are supposed to have standards? You didn't. You didn't answer your your own question. What accounts for this unraveling of the fundamental mission um, of of the university? I'm I'm wondering how the how the others think about that. Allison, do you do you have a sense of what explains what went wrong at at Vassar? Well, I wouldn't want to pronounce on Vassar. Um, I, I really believe, and I'm learning more about this each, each day, that we need to come to terms fully with our own history here in this country. So part of the problem that students have today in interpreting what they should be doing to make the United States a better place, in my view, is distorted by their lack of understanding of compared to what. You don't like this in the United States, compared to what? If you have more of a knowledge of what politics looks like in other parts of the globe, you might have a different re response to, to the United States. But more specifically with our country, and I'm, I'm hoping to teach a class on this when I get back to Middlebury, there is so much that's been, for lack of a better word, whitewashed. The Civil Rights Museum, for example, right here in Memphis, it's so extraordinary to go to that because, you know, you have this vague idea in your head, if you're from my generation, that Martin Luther King, you know, said speeches. these things that resonated with people and it, you know, we took America to a better place and it's almost like, you know, black particip participation has been written out of that history. Then you go to the museum and you realize a lot of people resisted and died and suffered repeatedly over and over and over again to get us to that point. Uh, at Harvard University, when I was a student, the one course required of all government concentrators was sophomore tutorial, American Constitutional Democracy. And I was a teaching fellow for that. 
So the professors would come in, we were graduate students, they would come in and they would tell us how to teach certain things. And we got to the Civil War, and I'm not making this up. They came in, uh, the professor came in and said to us, your students are going to believe that the Civil War was about slavery. Your job is to teach them it was more complicated than that. And it was all the states' rights arguments and so forth. The historical record shows that the Civil War was about slavery. So why would they want to teach students that? Well, it's not malevolent. Think about it, if you wanted to keep the country together as one country after that cataclysmic event, you had to kind of kick it upstairs to, to focus on the theoretical arguments, which were very real, and downplay the ugly, hateful aspect of it. So I think if we're going to move the United States to a better place, we've got to come to terms both with the histories of politics in other countries, but also with our own history, and that will move us forward in positive ways. That's my hope. Yeah. Thank you for that. Jonathan, uh, I want to give you a chance to answer your own question. But you, you said Vassar is only one, one data point in, in many, but it's, it is an interesting question. How, how do you account for it, and do you draw any generalization from it about the state of intellectual life? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, different campuses really are different. But I think there are at least some uh, general propositions one could put out there to take a guess at it. So uh, I described the mission, this is one take on the mission of a university, um, as that one enters into a community that's prepared to follow an argument wherever it leads. Um, and, and to check it, to use um, some of John's language and to follow the evidence wherever it leads, um, the data, right? Um, but colleges and universities do a lot of other things also. Um, and I think there's a certain amount of mission confusion at many universities. To just take one example, um, if you read the um, Port Huron Statement, um, which is a primary document of the student movement um, of the 1960s, they'll tell you that what we want to do um, with universities is to turn them into bases for an assault upon the loci of power. To turn them into bases for assault on the loci of power. And th this is an argument that didn't disappear um, with the 1960s. I'm not suggesting that you know, teachers in general are bearded radicals, but this is an argument that has some influence that even if you were to say, right, I'm interested in a partial investigation, if I were to say that to one of my colleagues, Right? Even a colleague who sympathized with me might give me a quizzical and somewhat skeptical smile and say, well, isn't everything political, really? Right? So there's a sense in which the, the mission I described um, of the university has come into question in favor, not simply of Port Huron, but other um, priorities, um, civic education, um, creating global citizens, training students to deal with complexity, in an interdependent world, to use language that many colleges and universities um, use. And I, I think for this reason, in many respects, it's not simply students, but faculty and administrators who have in many ways taken their eye off the ball. I mean, this mission, the first one I mentioned, doesn't happen by itself. It's profoundly, I think, unnatural and fragile. I was, we were discussing with uh, faculty members at lunch, how difficult it is even for faculty members to have these discussions with each other and try to follow the argument and evidence where they lead, right? Without other, let's call them tribal considerations coming in, right? These are my friends, these are the people I don't like. That's going to affect how I take the argument. So it's, it's a Herculean effort to establish the kind of um, truth system, again, to use the kind of language that um, Jonathan Rauch used earlier. Um, and requires a singularity of focus that I think is, is lacking in, in, in a lot of places, maybe most places. So uh, in just a, a moment, I'm going to ask you if you have questions, uh, if, you, if you have written questions, to pass them along, and Professor Wurls will collect them. And I think Professor Dolgoy is out there somewhere doing, doing the same. And I'm going to ask. Jonathan Rauch to uh, come up and participate in the 
Q&A also. But as he does that, let's have a, a lightning round. So oh, if it's gosh. more than a two-word uh, answer, you, you fail and there two, is no, two, there is two no words. prize. Two words, right. Um, and, we, and we turn the temperature down. Uh, should colleges, should co colleges and universities adopt the Chicago principles? Um, Allison, you want to start? Maybe just say very briefly. You can have more than two words for this. What the Chicago principles are are about? My answer would be yes, and that if you read the Chicago principles, they're quite reasonable and reflect the mission of the university as a true seeking mission. Okay. And, and for those who haven't read them, this is a statement from the University of Chicago saying we're not going to do trigger warnings, we're, we're emphatically committed to free inquiry, there's going to be controversy, there's going to be discomfort, uh, but it didn't say there were. It didn't say there weren't no any trigger warnings. That was an accompanying letter. From, ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, didn't say anything about that. That violates that. Stand that correct. Yeah. Exactly. But, but interestingly, I was at Princeton speaking at Princeton on Friday, and Princeton adopted those principles by unanimous vote. Right. Jonathan? With modifications. Um, so, for example, I, I teach at a college with a, a primary mission of teaching, and I think the Chicago statement is on the whole quite right, but doesn't say enough of the obligations of teachers um, to deal with the many obstacles um, that crop up um, when you're trying to uh, when you're trying to have open inquiry on campus. You started off this afternoon saying you were going to qualify everything you said, and you're staying in character. That's, that's good. That's not exactly what I'm doing, right. <laughs> Laura Beth. <laughs> As uh, a professor, the other. Chicago University, Northwestern University, I would encourage you to read Morton Shapiro, our illustrious and fantastic university president's response to the Chicago principles. Yes, they are excellent, um, and they should be considered with, um, they should be considered along with some other things, the obligation of the professor, but also an, ob an obligation to provide a safe living space for people, you need to have a place where you can go and decompress if you if you live on campus. Okay, we're not doing well with the with the lightning aspect, and that's my fault. Uh, <laughs> but I've I've got an, another one, and this really can be yes, yes, no. Um, do you want your college to have a bias reporting system? It already yes. does. Do you want your college to have one? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, Jonathan. No. Yes. No. Imagine yourself as an adjunct professor. Would you, Jonathan Rauch, want one? No. Yeah. You supported them 15 minutes ago. I thought <laughs> too. <laughs> but he wants a reporter to, to him as the offender. Right. <laughs> um, college discipline for microaggressions, acts of offensive acts of cultural appropriation, should student affairs be trying to police these with regulations or not? I'm for discipline for macro aggressions only. <laughs> I have one in mind. <laughs> <laughs> we'll turn the heat up eventually, uh, John. Um, I'm also going to say no, but I, I hope we'll have a chance to talk about it uh, later on. Universities are profoundly bad replacements for courts. Um, I'm with Allison. On the temperature, too? It's fine. It I really don't even is. know what that means. So let's, what, let's, what let's have some, uh, some questions from, from the students. We've been, we've been talking about you. Have you been totally misunderstood? Are you happy? Maligned? Are you happy, people? Are you okay? Yes. Uh, it seems like the consensus is that there's not necessarily a free speech crisis, but rather that people aren't willing to speak up. Um, 
is there a certain cost or lack of incentive for people to engage in, in the sort of liberal free speech tradition on campuses? And if so, is that a process? I, th I think there's a, at Princeton I had several parents come up to me on Friday to tell me stories about things that happened to their children at Middlebury where they were socially ostracized for doing something that was, I think one was an instance of um, a, student, a white student really liked hip hop and invited a white rapper to campus and that was seen as cultural appropriation. But the, sting, the stinging part was it just stuck, the label stuck with this student for his entire time there. And that is alarming to me. You know, peer pressure is so powerful that's where I get back to my point about modeling the behavior we want to see. If you can find like-minded people who want to um, be free thinkers, hang out with them. Form critical mass and hopefully persuade others that this kind of uh, crucible-like environment that can sometimes exist is not healthy for anyone and certainly isn't bringing about a, a more just world. I I'd like to see someone argue that piece, you know, someone who's had their individual life destroyed uh, has somehow been a contribution to a more just world. I just don't, I just don't see it. Did I, others I, want to? Uh, yeah. well, I, th I think you need to, well, I think self-censorship is troubling. I teach in a class, in my big law and society class, which I was teaching during the election. Um, the, the Donald Trump election, I had students speaking up in class saying I'm gonna vote for Donald Trump and it's because you set a different kind of expert and they know I'm a liberal. <laughs> and it's because you set expectations and I was saying to the faculty yeah. earlier, use anonymous polls and show the students that there are other pro-lifers in their class before you're gonna teach the abortion cases. Use, um, Use small group interactions, face-to-face -face interactions, like give a question and have the students talk and then have them talk about their disagreement in the class. What were the arguments? What were the empirical claims that we could find an answer to using science? And what are the normative claims? And we're not gonna agree on the normative claims, and we shouldn't. I get to have my religious beliefs and you get to have your religious beliefs or your value beliefs, but on the empirical claims, like, are children in gay marriage families really screwed up, right? That is an empirical question that somebody faked the data about, blah, blah, blah. But um, we can answer these questions and we need to know what we're asking that's answerable empirically and what are our normative things that we're imposing on that. Yeah, um, well, I, I think that this kind of stigma is a predictable consequence of opening up the discussion, the way it's not surprising, uh, John referred in the earlier session to John Stuart Mill, and he does make an argument for having almost utterly open discussion. He says um, that uh, we're one-sided beings. We're really bad judges because we're one-sided beings who mistake our understanding, which is partial, um, for the whole. And the only remedy for that, the only thing that really makes us correctable, right, is that we can be presented um, with a variety of opinions. We really need to be presented with every variety of opinion, is um, Mill's phrase. But he doesn't think that that's going to result to everybody joining hands and singing merrily together. In fact, what he says about it is, is a little bit strange. Um, what he says is that it's actually going to usually increase um, the intensity of partisanship. In a way, people will start to hate each other more. You could ignore them before you knew they held these opinions. But now that you see there are people who hold these opinions, you, you, you hate them and think that they're bad people, right? Um, so that's a problem. Mill's solution to it is, is sort of, sort of uh, funny in a way. He says, well, it's not on everybody that this is going to have a salutary effect. It's on the, uh, the uh, calmer and more disinterested bystander. Right? It's a very funny model. It's sort of, you know, I, I, I give you a, a pro-Trump and anti-Trump uh, speaker you guys start foaming with the mouth, throw things at each other, and Allison sits there with a the pen. So this is very interesting. I'm learning a lot from <laughs> looking at this variety of opinions. That's not an educational model, mm -hmm. right? So our educational model does indeed have to be changing the culture 
in some manner or another um, to, maybe Mill's vision isn't perfect, but into something like this more disinterested, which is not the same as disinterested comma, which is not quite the same as com, right? A kind of person who's, who's capable of and appreciates the value of this discussion that's being had. And the more such people there are, right, the more stigma will attach to not listening to arguments and evidence. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, Jonathan Rauch, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to anything you heard from the panel that I thought I was the designated Jonathan. You up. <laughs> well, we're, we're breaking all the rules now. <laughs> I'd just actually like to respond to the question we just sure. had because it was so beautifully stated. Thank you. It, it said in a few words what I was trying to say with many, which is, we seem to be moving from a situation where the issue on campus, notice I didn't say crisis, is less one of top-down censorship and more one of bottom-up peer pressure. That is harder to resolve, and one of the reasons for that is, yeah, it's bad when students create a culture of calling out and an intellectual, ideological monoculture in which if you don't believe whatever is the right thing, you're seen as a threat to the community. But it's also bad when students succumb to that kind of pressure. And typically they do. Usually it seems because it's too much effort and too risky to speak out and they don't know if they'll get any support and it's gonna greatly complicate their lives. And all of that I understand. But it's important to remember that the most oppressed and marginalized minority of all in any society is not race, class, or gender, it's the dissident. It's the person with the unpopular opinion and the only way to address that is to be willing to speak up. And so part of the answer here is, you know, sometimes the snowflakes in the situation are the people who don't push back, who don't stand up for their own views and if you don't do it, no one else will do it for you. The question I'm most commonly asked when I talk about these issues on campus is, what do I say when I try to participate in a conversation on campus and I'm told I'm disqualified because I'm white or male or heterosexual or whatever the disqualification is? How do I deal with that? And you know, I used to try to say, well, try this or that or you know, anti-bullying and I realized, no, that's the wrong answer. The, wrong, the right answer is, Buddy, you need to figure out the answer to that question. That is your job. The important thing isn't what you say in that situation, and it's what you do. It's that you keep talking. Don't let them shut you down. So there is a burden in this environment of peer pressure for those who experience it to pull themselves together and push back. And when you do, the results will be surprisingly good because there are going to be a lot of people who agree with you, who have not been willing to speak up. Well, that's well said. And I, I want to close with a little bit more Jonathan Rauch. Toward, toward the end of his, his book, he takes up what he says is the, the deepest argument on, on the other side, the side that suggests, you know, we, we can't tolerate the speech we hate when it passes a, a certain point. We have to, we have to shut it down. His, his response is, gay people have lived in a world where they were forced, that forced them to betray their consciences and keep their mouths shut in the name of public morality. Now, he says, our duty, meaning the duty of every, everybody, our duty is to protect others' freedom to be wrong, the better to ensure society's odds of, of being right. I think that's very powerfully and persuasively put and a fitting place to end. And thanks so much to all of you for coming. This has been an extraordinary panel and afternoon one of the better Constitution days we've had. Constitution. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.